Male sexual anatomy is mostly presented as if it is all about reproduction. Even though reproduction is only a fraction of what drives male sexuality. True discussions of male sexual anatomy must include the concept of pleasure, the greatest part of what drives male sexuality. Three simple questions will demonstrate just how great this pleasure is. First, ask any adult male to calculate the number of times he had and will have sex for reproductive purposes. Next, ask him to calculate the number of times he had and will have sex for purposes of pleasure. Lastly, ask him which question's calculated number is greater. Way, way, way greater. Thus, this video explores male sexual anatomy in terms of its capacities for pleasure and to a lesser extent, reproduction. The most prominent part of a male's sexual anatomy is his penis. The penis has three main functions, initiating orgasm, transporting semen from the body, and transporting urine from the body. The central and peripheral nervous systems are necessary for initiating an orgasm, which is defined as a physiological release of neuromuscular tension paired with tremendous feelings of pleasure and euphoria. An ejaculation is necessary for transporting semen from the body. Although they often occur at about the same time, ejaculating and orgasming are two different physiological responses. In fact, it is physiologically possible for a man to ejaculate without orgasming and to orgasm without ejaculating. There is no more pleasure associated with ejaculating than there is with urinating. More than 90% of males have orgasms throughout their lifetimes. And the penis, whether being physically stimulated by the male himself or some other person, is often the primary part of the male's sexual anatomy being used to initiate these orgasms. For example, the Kinsey Institute has found the penis involved in two of the top three sex acts, most likely leading to orgasm when males are with a partner. These three sex acts are, number one, receiving anal intercourse, number two, penile vaginal intercourse, and number three, receiving penile masturbation. Before I get any further into our discussions about the penis, pleasure, and orgasms, I wanna stop here and talk about the length of the penis. Because our society shares more myths than scientific truths about the length of the penis, I want to share exactly what these truths are. Truth number one, the newborn's penis is about 1.3 inches in length. Truth number two, the greatest growth spurt for the penis occurs between 10 and 13 years of age. Truth number three, the penis typically stops growing by age 16. Truth number four, the average length of an adult's flaccid, that is non-erect, penis is about 3.6 inches. Truth number five, the average length of an adult's erect penis is about 5.2 inches. Truth number six, 75% of erect penises are between 4.3 and 5.9 inches in length. Truth number seven, 10% of males have erect penises less than 4.3 inches in length. And truth number eight, 15% of males have erect penises greater than 5.9 inches in length. One of the myths propagated about penis length is most females preferring an above average size penis during penile vaginal intercourse. The truth is an above average size penis is not predictive of pleasure or orgasm for males or females during sexual intercourse. What is predictive of orgasms occurring for males and females during the intercourse are the following factors. Factor number one, deep kissing occurring with sexual intercourse. Factor number two, sexual intercourse including oral sex, manual genital stimulation, or anal stimulation. 
Factor number three, sexual intercourse including new sexual positions. Factor number four, the people involved in the sexual intercourse asking what they want. Factor number five, sexy talk occurring with sexual intercourse. Factor number six, how long the sexual intercourse lasts. Factor number seven, verbal expressions of love occurring with sexual intercourse. And factor number eight, sexual intercourse occurring within a satisfying relationship. Now, if you're really interested in knowing the length of a particular man's erect penis, then you're going to have to actually see it. Because there's no reliable correlations between a man's erect penis and asking the man about the size of his erect penis. Surprise, surprise, men tend to exaggerate the size of their penises. There are no reliable correlations between the length of a man's erect penis and the length of the man's flaccid penis or the length of his other body parts, including his feet, hands, forearms, and overall height. In fact, no one body part size or length is predictive of the size or length of the erect penis. There are no reliable correlations between the length of a man's erect penis and the man's race or ethnicity. No one race or ethnicity is predictive of the size or length of the erect penis. In fact, most of the popular myths about race being associated with penis size have deep, systemic, and implicitly racist roots. Anatomically speaking, the penis has three main parts, the base, the shaft, and the glands. Within the pelvis, and not externally visible, the base of the penis is composed of erectile tissues and muscles. Between the base and glands, the shaft of the penis is composed entirely of erectile tissue. The erectile tissue composing the base and shaft of the penis allows for erections. Erectile dysfunction, or ED, is the inability to have an erection or maintain an erection. ED has a variety of physical causes like diabetes or psychological causes like anxiety and affects about a third of the male population. Unfortunately, only about a quarter of those with ED seek treatment for it, even though almost all causes of ED can be addressed either educationally, emotionally, or medically. The glands also called the head of the penis, is highly sensitive, composed of thousands of sensory nerve endings, and is the specific part of the penis, especially its underside, most associated with initiating orgasms. The glands also has the urethral opening, which allows semen and urine to exit the body. Foreskin covers the glands, except in circumcised males, whose foreskin has been surgically removed. As many as 92% of males in the United States are circumcised, whereas in Europe, less than 20% of males are circumcised. Circumcision is controversial. It has medical benefits as it decreases the probability of acquiring the human immunodeficiency virus and other sexually transmitted infections. But a 2013 study found circumcised males when compared to uncircumcised males, had lower penile sensitivity and lower ability to orgasm. In addition to the penis, there are two other prominent parts of a male's sexual anatomy, the scrotum and the testicles. The scrotum is a sack of wrinkled skin behind and below the penis. The scrotum contains the testicles. The wrinkly appearance of the scrotum is telling of its function. The scrotum maintains the temperature necessary for sperm production by moving the testicles outside of the body cavity. The temperature in the scrotum is about 6 degrees Fahrenheit lower than the temperature within the body. To maintain this temperature difference in normal sperm production, the scrotum moves the testicles further from the body when the internal body temperature increases, and the scrotum moves the testicles closer to the body when the internal body temperature decreases. The testicles, also called the testes, are glands that produce sperm cells and the hormones testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. Testicles generally produce more testosterone than the female's ovaries, and the ovaries 
generally produce more estrogen than the testicles. However, testosterone is no longer scientifically seen as a male hormone, and estrogen is no longer seen as a female hormone because both hormones are needed for normal human development and sexual behavior. The anus is the opening at the end of the rectum through which solid waste matter leaves the body. It is also a highly pleasurable sex organ for the male. As already briefly mentioned, a Kinsey Institute study reported when comparing males engaged in mutual masturbation, penile vaginal intercourse, receiving anal intercourse, giving anal intercourse, receiving oral intercourse, or giving oral intercourse, those engaged in receiving anal intercourse were most likely to report having an orgasm. With its dense sensory nerve innervation shared with the muscles involved in orgasm, few other organs besides the gland's penis are as anatomically equipped to promote orgasm intensity. However, the anus does not have any self-lubricating glands to aid in anal intercourse. Thus, beyond angolingus, lubricants are often necessary for pleasure to come from anal intercourse. And the best lubricants to use are store-bought lubricants because natural lubricants like saliva are associated with promoting sexually transmitted infections. It should be noted, just as testosterone and estrogen cannot be typecast as male or female sex hormones, so too cannot anal intercourse be typecast as the gay man's intercourse. Anal intercourse certainly may involve the penis and the anus, but is just as likely to involve a dildo and the anus, fingers and the anus, or the tongue and the anus. In fact, when heterosexual males are asked about their sexual behaviors, about 40% of them report having anal intercourse at some time during their lives, with 10% of them reporting being on the receiving end of anal intercourse. Comparatively, when homosexual males are asked about their most recent sexual behaviors, about 40% of them report having anal intercourse. Like heterosexual males, homosexual males engage in a variety of partnered sexual behaviors, with the most frequent being kissing, followed by oral sex and mutual masturbation. Although stereotypes and myths say otherwise, science finds no matter if we're heterosexual or homosexual, we're a lot more alike than we are different when it comes to our avenues for sexual pleasure. The internal organs composing the sexual anatomy of the male produce semen, transport sperm cells, or serve as erogenous zones. Semen keeps sperm cells healthy and allows for their transportation. Semen is composed mostly of sugar, but it also contains prostatic fluid, proteins and fatty acids, and of course sperm, which make up only about 1% of a typical semen-composed ejaculate. Erogenous zones are sensitive areas of the skin. When touched, males interpret erogenous zones as being ticklish, painful, or sexually pleasing. Erogenous zones are sexually pleasing because they increase levels of oxytocin and dopamine. Oxytocin is the so-called love hormone. It causes feelings of empathy, trust, love, and sensuality. And it has positive physiological effects on ejaculation and penile erections. Dopamine is the so-called feel-good neurotransmitter. Dopamine causes feelings of pleasure and satisfaction. It also boosts attention, motivation, and mood. And because it is a significant part of the brain's reward system, dopamine is associated with learning, memory, and emotions. The internal organs composing the sexual anatomy of the male include the epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, prostate gland, copper's glands, and the urethra. The epididymis is a twisted duct that matures, stores, and transports sperm cells into the vas deferens. The vas deferens is a muscular tube that transports mature sperm cells to the urethra, except in males who have had a vasectomy. A vasectomy involves surgically creating a void within the vas deferens. Vasectomized males ejaculate semen without sperm cells. 
Interestingly, a 2017 study found when compared to before having a vasectomy, vasectomized males had greater erectile function, orgasms, sexual desire, and sexual satisfaction. The seminal vesicles are glands that provide energy for sperm cells to move. This energy is in the form of the sugar fructose. The prostate gland provides a fluid within the semen that nourishes the sperm cells. Additionally, because of its dense sensory nerve innervation when physically stimulated, the prostate gland is associated with pleasure and orgasm. Case studies describe prostate-induced orgasms as having extreme bouts of shaking and shuddering and being infinitely more pleasurable than penile-induced orgasms. The copper's glands produce a fluid that lubricates the urethra and neutralizes any acidity due to urine. The urethra is a tube that carries semen and urine outside of the body. And let us not forget the brain. Neuroimaging studies show extensive areas of it active when males have orgasms brought on by masturbation performed by their partners. Some of these areas include the ventral tegmental area, the midbrain lateral central tegmental field, thalamic nuclei, lateral putamen, the claustrum, cerebellum, and Broadman areas 21, 40, and 47. As mentioned, the penis, anus, and prostate gland are considered primary erogenous zones, bringing sexual pleasure and orgasm to the male. Additionally, a 2014 study found males include the mouth, lips, scrotum, inner thigh, nape of the neck, nipples, perineum, pubic hairline, back of the neck, and ears within their top 10 erogenous areas of their bodies. The skin is not only the male's biggest organ, but it is also his biggest sex organ. In fact, a 2016 study reported males find 37% of their body's skin as being erogenous. I'll end this video with three hopes. First, I hope this video removed some of the many stereotypes and myths associated with male sexual anatomy. Second, I hope this video allowed you to become more aware of your own sexual anatomy. And last, I hope this video serves as a catalyst for your own research and explorations into sexual anatomy and pleasure.